Welcome to the University of Washington Bronchoscopy Modules. I'm Rosemary Adamson, and today I'm going to talk about how to perform transbronchial biopsies. First, I'm going to review how to choose the location for performing biopsies. Then, I will describe a step-by-step -step approach to the manipulation of the bronchoscope and the forceps. I will describe two techniques for taking transbronchial biopsies. One technique is to wedge the bronchoscope in the airway of interest, and the alternative is to keep the tip of the bronchoscope proximal to the airway of interest. I will refer to these as the wedge and proximal view techniques. Lastly, I will discuss the optimal number of transbronchial biopsy samples to take. Before getting started, you should review the imaging carefully to identify which subsegmental airway leads to the biopsy target. Typically, we do this by following the airways while scrolling through the CT, performing a virtual bronchoscopy. In this example, the target lesion is a right upper lobe mass. When scrolling through the images, you can see that the bronchoscope must enter the apical segment and then a lateral branch of the apical segment to reach the target lesion. By contrast, in this example, the disease is diffuse. In such cases, we typically choose to take biopsies from the lower lobes or the right middle lobe. These locations carry some advantages over the upper lobes. Firstly, when we biopsy in the lower lobes, gravity helps to keep any blood in the biopsy segment. Whereas, when we biopsy in the upper lobes, blood can drain into the rest of the lung much more easily. Secondly, the route from the trachea to the segmental airways is straighter, so it is easier to pass the forceps through the working channel. In fact, it is sometimes impossible to biopsy in the upper lobes, because you cannot push the stiff forceps around the tight bend. Before you start the bronchoscopy, you should decide which procedures are necessary and the order you will do them. You should also tell your technician if you want any samples to be placed in saline to be sent to the micro lab for culture. Once samples have been placed in formaldehyde solution to be sent to pathology, they cannot be used to culture organisms. You can have all your samples placed in saline and then transfer some into formaldehyde solution at the end of the procedure. In this module, I use fluoroscopy images to illustrate techniques, but you don't have to use fluoroscopy. Studies suggest that fluoroscopy can increase the diagnostic yield of transbronchial biopsies from masses or nodules. Many providers feel that using fluoro helps to reduce the risk of pneumothorax, but there are limited data on this subject. However, fluoroscopy is particularly useful when using the wedge approach, since vision is typically lost after taking the first sample using this method. Bear in mind that many lesions visible on chest x-rays and CTs are not visible on fluoro. Here's an example of a very obvious mass on chest x-ray. And here's what it looked like on fluoro. Much less obvious. Bronchoscopists often have a personal preference for either the wedge or the proximal view approach. The proximal view approach allows sampling from more than one airway, from the same position. However, if there is a lot of bleeding, you may lose vision and then find yourself unable to navigate back to the correct subsegment to manage the bleeding. Using the wedge approach, any blood should be contained in the segment being biopsied. The management of bleeding will be addressed in a subsequent module. Sometimes the approach used is driven by anatomical considerations. Occasionally the airway in question is too narrow to wedge in, as in this airway. And in other cases, such as this right upper lobe mass, the bronchoscopists found themselves unable to stay wedged and pass the forceps through the working channel. This often happens when trying to perform biopsies in the upper lobes, because passing the stiff forceps through the working channel straightens the bronchoscope out of the tight flexion required to enter the upper lobe segments. You can see in the image on the right that the bend in the bronchoscope was less tight using the proximal view technique, and so the forceps could pass through. When it is time to take the transbronchial biopsies, maneuver the bronchoscope into the chosen airway. Here you can see the bronchoscope wedging in the right lower lobe lateral segment, and vision is lost. The forceps are passed through the working channel and attention turns to the fluoroscopy screen. Continue passing the forceps until you meet resistance or until you can see on fluoro that your forceps are within a centimetre of the pleural surface, whichever comes first. Then retract the forceps a couple of centimetres. Next open the forceps, and pass the open forceps a shorter distance than before, and until you feel gentle resistance. Then close the forceps, pause for a moment, and then retract. Remember to pass the forceps gently. If you can see the bronchoscope moving away from the tip of the forceps, you are pushing too hard on the forceps and probably increase the risk of causing damage to the lung. During the final step, it is important to hold the forceps closed for a moment before retracting the forceps. This gives the forceps jaws time to fully close and cut the sample. Some providers take this moment to ask the patient if they have any chest pain, 
If they do indicate they have chest pain, you should be concerned that the forceps are cutting pleura and let go of the sample. When retracting the forceps, it is normal to feel a small tug as the sample is removed from the lung. However, if you find yourself really pulling to retract the forceps, you should let go of the sample by opening the forceps. It takes experience to differentiate a normal tug from too much resistance. The samples are transferred from the forceps into saline or formaldehyde solution. The forceps are then rinsed in saline before reinsertion. All this time the bronchoscope is kept wedged in the airway of interest and multiple samples can be taken without having to reposition. In order to stay in the wedged position, you often need to hold the bronchoscope at the patient's nose. You can ask a team member to do this for you if necessary. Remember when performing biopsies from a wedged position, you typically have read out of your bronchoscopic image. Therefore, some bronchoscopists advocate tapping on the suction channel between biopsy samples to see if there has been any bleeding. If there has been significant bleeding, you can manage it before deciding whether to proceed with further biopsies. Other bronchoscopists do not check for bleeding between biopsies. Instead, they keep the bronchoscope wedged and take multiple samples from the same position and then manage any bleeding once they have obtained all the samples they need. The main downside of the wedge approach is that you typically lose vision after taking the first biopsy sample. This makes it hard to know exactly when the forceps have reached the end of the working channel and it is possible to accidentally pass the forceps further than you intended before turning on fluoro. One way to avoid this is to mark the forceps the first time you insert it. When the tip of the forceps has just exited the working channel, mark the shaft with tape about 5 cm from the working channel entrance. Then you can use this mark as your signal to turn on fluoro and continue feeding the forceps very gently to feel for resistance. OK, we've gone through all the steps for taking transbronchial biopsies. Now let's review them. First, get in position. Then insert the forceps until you meet resistance. Then retract the forceps a couple of centimeters. Next, open the forceps and pass the open forceps a shorter distance than before and until you feel gentle resistance. Then close the forceps, pause for a moment, and then retract. Some providers time their biopsies with the patient's breathing. You can see in these images that the open forceps are passed out while the patient is inhaling and then closed at the end of exhalation. The reason for doing this is to try to obtain larger samples, because the forceps close on the lung parenchyma when it is at its most contracted. It may also allow sampling of more distal tissue because the alveoli move proximally during exhalation. When biopsying a mass visible on fluoroscopy, the manipulation of the forceps is a little different than when taking biopsies for a diffuse disease. The closed forceps are passed until they appear to be within the mass, and do not have to be passed until you meet resistance. Once the forceps appear to be within the mass, retract a couple centimeters, open the forceps, and pass the open forceps until they appear to be within the mass again, and then close, hold, and withdraw. The number of samples required to obtain a diagnosis varies depending on the underlying pathology. This graph demonstrates that the diagnostic yield is higher with more biopsy samples, and that 6 to 10 samples gives you around a 70% diagnostic yield. Even with perfect technique, a number of samples often contain little alveolar parenchyma. Therefore, it makes sense to take at least six samples. When evaluating for lung transplant rejection, the recommendation is to take 10 to 12 samples in order to ensure that there are at least five good alveolar samples. To summarize this module, we have reviewed the steps performed when taking transbronchial biopsies. With practice, these steps become second nature. The decision to wedge or remain in a proximal viewing position may be determined by anatomy, which prevents wedging, or by provider preference. It is worth becoming familiar with both techniques. The diagnostic yield from transbronchial biopsy improves with increasing sample numbers. We recommend taking at least six samples in all situations and 10 to 12 if evaluating for acute lung transplant rejection.